Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So Fred and Ted were talking. And Fred said, Ted, did you know that my dog can talk? <laughs> and Ted said, no. He said, he can. I'm going to ask him a question. What's on top of the house? Roof. <laughs> See? Yeah, but I bet he can't answer any other questions. Turned to his dog and he said, tell me the nature of sandpaper. Ruff! <laughs> I still don't believe you. Well, I'll ask him one more question. Who's the greatest baseball player? Ruth! <laughs> and, and Ted said, I guess you're right, Fred. Your dog can talk. And he walked away and the dog looked at Fred and said, should I have said you're Don Alvarez? <laughs> So those who are not sports fans, as a matter of fact, I saw somebody call sports an idolatry before the Lord. <laughs> call me a sinner then, because I do love it. And, you know, it's like the one place in my life where I can put good versus evil, because in unity, our theology doesn't allow it. Our, our theology requires that we see God everywhere present, except when we're playing a game. <laughs> No, we could absolutely bless them and, and love them for the spirit of God expressing in a perfect form as we beat the living tar out of them. You know, that's the way, that's the way we do it. So normally on a su uh, Sunday, we, have a, we plan a 70-minute service, which is sort of a nice compromise between the 55-minute Episcopalians, people that grew up that way, and the two-hour folks from whatever church you grew up there that had two hours. I, I've been in those churches. So we do 70 minutes, but in Celebration Sunday, we're going to go a little bit longer. We're here to celebrate, so we add more music, and, and, but here's the great thing. We're going to feed you right out there. we got food for purchase. We've got the band. will be outside, so there's a party right after, so you, you'll want to come. You, you, want to, you want to spend a little bit more time here today. I think you'll, you'll love it. So today, it is the final Sunday of our six-week Touchstone program, and we have been talking about prospering, thriving, and serving but Celebration Sunday is also the day that we celebrate the life of the community and how to do both of those things. Well, I'm going to do it here in 20 minutes. Watch me. So each week, we've been, the six weeks, we've been talking about how in these three areas, these are human demonstrations of divine principle. The human experience of prosperity is, a, is an expression of the divine principle of abundance. And we've talked about thriving being in a human experience of the divine principle of, um, what was the one I used? It'll come to me in a minute. Wholeness, that's it, the divine property of wholeness. And then the last one, service, we're talking about serving each other is an expression of the divine principle of oneness. And this is a... It's non-duality, we would say, in a, from a, a perspective of philosophy as we're looking at worldviews in, in spiritual traditions or religions. We're talking about it in terms of, uh, yeah, theology. And our name really is our theology. There are many traditions. Most of the Western religions do have a sense of duality, like there's good versus evil, right? When you die, you're going to go to heaven or, you know, you know. But we have a very different understanding of reality. That there is one presence and one power everywhere present and powerful, waiting for our recognition. And when we can look past our, our misguided perception and tap into the reality of God's presence right here, right now, no matter what you're going through, then we begin to demonstrate a higher order of reality into our lives. This is what we teach. And how do we get there? You know, I do wish, it's like, you know, when I go to the gym every once in a while, I do wish <laughs> that I could just do like one sit-up and be done for life, you know? <laughs> but it just, you know it doesn't work that way. And it's the same with our thinking. We must come to a practice. This is the word I was trying to get to, practice. We have to find a practice, a way of living into it. 
And we do hold service as a beautiful practice, as a way of moving ourselves into a lived experience that I need you, you need me. We are one. That's what this means. So we have three value statements that we created a few years ago, and I'm just going to read those to you as we get to them. The first one we're talking about, it's our being statement. Our being statement says this, we live from our oneness with God and each other, experiencing abundance and connection with all life. Last week, I I shared from the story when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and then Peter's response was, no, you can't, not me, that's not... That upsets the the world order of hierarchy, hierarchy. and Jesus said this, if I can get to it, in uh, John um, 8, which, John 13, 8, I I like, for those of you who are Bible people, you want the reference, Jesus says this, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. You have no part of me, is another way of saying it. What Jesus is talking about is this metaphysical understanding when we serve another, one another, we are a part of each other. We're demonstrating our oneness. This church wouldn't survive without service. It's, I don't, I mean, all, all churches are that way. All nonprofits are really largely supported by people just giving out of the goodness of their heart, of their finances and their time and their energy and their talent. That's how it works in spiritual community. We're no different. That we wouldn't be in this place if people didn't give all those years ago. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of this sanctuary, and we're going to be celebrating that in 2024. And all of the people who sacrificed and gave lovingly, beautifully, to build this beautiful place where we now get to be here on every Sunday morning without having to give a thought to it. This church walks its talk. I want you to know that. That we don't just ask you to serve us, we serve. We, we make financial contribution to our, our, our parent organization or our, our organization, it used to be the, what was it called? The Association of Unity Churches, started by Eric Butterworth in the 60s. Now it's Unity Worldwide Ministries. We, we tied Jean Marie, she is a, 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 on the board of that organization. She gives a lot of time to you. We, we support there. Our Unity in the Community. Who has volunteered with Unity, Unity in the Community in the last year with our food drives or our party? Look around. It's all these people who have given of their time, their energy, to help Unity give back beyond our church walls and our church doors. We've been contributing to the healing the consciousness by our Healing the Heart of America initiative. It's been going on for, I think, seven or eight years now, Cindy. Looking at these things that divide us in our country, can we find the spiritual truth? Can we educate ourselves to heal our own racism, to heal our own gender, um, wrong ideas about the way this works? Can we find a way to heal? This is one, these are all just examples of many of the ways that this community walks this talk of living from our oneness. And then becoming, that's our second value, and this is the statement where we say to practice, through practice and Through grace, there we go, I wrote it down wrong. Through practice and through grace, I know this one. We heal and grow, revealing the Christ within. Ain't none of you perfect yet. Some of you may not know that, so that may be harsh news, but all of you have a little room for improvement. We all do. While we're here in this um, incarnate reality of space and time and form, We have places where we can heal and grow, and we do this together and individually. There's no arrival. There's no way that one day it's just going to be all complete and, like, no more problems, like like as if we won the World Series or something. (laughs) That just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in this realm. I'm just going to keep this on for a few minutes. And I know that now that we have expanded our membership beyond Houston, I understand that our our fan base doesn't extend much beyond our city right now. So those of you who are watching right now, hang with me for just a minute. And I want to tell you, too, that um, I do see you, and we are committed to finding ways to make sure that you get your needs met, whether or not you live in Houston or that you're a part of our Sunday celebrations in, in person. And also, be comforted by this. There are people in this room that don't like the Astros, and they have to put up with me, too. So... There's that. I was thinking about how to tie last night's win into my sermon. (laughs) And then if they didn't win, how I was going to tie in one more game. But uh, thank God they did. But I did figure out a way. 
Jeremy, Jeremy Pena was born in the Dominican Republic in 1997. He is a kid. He's 25 years old. His family moved to Rhode Island when he was nine years old. He spoke no English. His dad had played in the big leagues here in America for six years for the Cleveland Indians as an outfielder in the 90s. Um, and so there was a little bit of pressure or maybe an invitation for Jeremy to go into his dad's line of work. And he played in grade school and elementary. And in high school, he got pretty good. Good enough that he was um, submitted for the draft, for the major league baseball draft from high school. And in the 39th round, that's way down there, in the 39th round, the Atlanta Braves organization offered him a position, but he said, no, thank you. So he went to college, and he was going to play ball in college at that great baseball powerhouse, University of Maine. <laughs> For those of you who are not baseball fans or college baseball fans, they are not a college <laughs> ball powerhouse. But he continued to improve. He continued to get better, to learn the craft. He continued. He was a skinny kid. He began to like build a little muscle, and he was never a power hitter in those days, but he was a pretty good fielder. He was quick, and he could learn. And so after, the, after college, he decided to um, go for the draft again, and this time he was drafted by the Houston Astros organization in the third round. And so what happened next? He made his professional debut with the Tri-City Valley Cats. I know, the Valley Cats. And that was, um, but he won all, that was in single A, um, minor league ball. But he, he, was, he made an all-star there. As the, that was great. In 2019, he began working with Class A Quad Cities River Bandits. And there he was also named an all-star. And before being promoted to the Fayetteville Woodpeckers <laughs> of Class A Advanced Carolina League in June. And after the season, he played in the Arizona Fall League with the Peoria, Peoria Javelinas, Arizona team. He didn't play in the minor league in 2020 because the, the pandemic, it was canceled. But then in 2021, it was announced that he would have to go up surgery, undergo surgery on his left wrist, and it cost him to miss most of that season. But he was activated off the injured list late in August of 2021, and he was assigned to the Sugarland Skeeters. Triple A, minor league ball. Working his way up, right? Growing. We heal and grow. Revealing the Christ within. And that's what Jeremy Pena was doing on this journey. So last year, Jeremy got called up to the majors. He was a part of the 40-man rotation for the Astros. Didn't play a single second of the season. We had another shortstop. Some of you may have heard of him. Carlos Correa, incredible player. Incredible player. And so Jeremy was just kind of watching. He was on what they call the taxi squad, where they took him to the playoff games, including the World Series, just in case horrible things happened. Then they, he would get to play, didn't get to play. This year in spring training, his commitment to his growth, his commitment to learn the game to improve paid off. They were looking for a new shortstop starting shortstop for the Houston Astros, one of the great teams in the Major League Baseball world. And Jeremy got his chance. They're like, who is this kid? I, I watched a lot of baseball this year. I like winning. I don't know. I, I, just, I just do. I'm going to admit it. It's, I, because I'm committed to non-duality and non-judgment, it's fun to win sometimes, some places. So Jeremy... He started hitting like right off the bat. As a matter of fact, they were interviewing his parents when he got his first major league home run. They were like, you missed it. Oh, no. But it was great. But then he hit a slump. Some of you may remember this. He had a thumb injury, and then he hit a slump. And everyone just kept saying, this is part of the game. And learning maturity is to learn how to just keep showing up when it's not working and, and turn it around. Do what you can. Improve. Healing and growing. Jeremy Pena, the first non-pitcher in Major League Baseball to win MVP of the League Championship Series and the World Series, the first as a rookie. Can you hear, do you hear that? That's a big deal. Yeah. I think so, too. Let's applaud that. Thank you, Bob.
Man. There were two signs that fans had made these signs, and two of my, two of my favorites. The first one was MV Pena, like MVP Pena. That's our Jeremy Pena. You know that he's going to have tough times in his career, right? He is. He's 25. He's got years ahead of him playing in this, and he's going he's to go through things. But what I see in him, which I hold as the sermon example, is that he's committed to growing. He's committing to get, getting better. He's going to do well. The second sign, which I really loved last night, was just very simply, it just said, a date with destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you about Dusty Baker. He's not 25. <laughs> He's 73, our manager. Came into the, <laughs> he came in to Major League Baseball in 1968 at 19 years old. He played 19 seasons, most notably with the Dodgers. During his Dodgers tenure, he was two-time All-Star, winning the Silver Slugger Awards and a Gold Glove Award. And he became the NLCS MVP during the 1977 Champions League, Championship League Series. And he also made three World Series appearances, and he won one in 1981. After retiring as a player, as many of the greats do, he wanted to become a coach. And so he became the manager of the San Francisco Giants from 93 to 2002, the Chicago Cubs from 2003 to 2006, the Cincinnati Reds, that was my childhood favorite team, from 2008 to 2013, and the Washington Nationals from 2016 to 2017. And then in 2017, he was unceremoniously dumped by the Nationals, fired after a year. This legendary player and successful manager, dumped. Here's the time where I think many people in their lives would be like, you know, I tried. Done what I can do. I think, my, my, I think, I think it's behind me. But there was something in Dusty Baker that was like, I'm not done yet. Partly because he had not won a World Series as a manager. But also just this desire to see what else is in the tank, see what else he could create. He tried for two years to get an interview with another team as manager and didn't get a single callback, not one. And in 2019, he did get a callback with the Philadelphia Phillies. I love them. <laughs> I do. Love them because that's who we won against. It's great. I have to do some forgiveness work around Kyle Schwarber, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> Dusty had a lot of um, hope for that position. He wanted that job bad. And his, and his son said that when he didn't get it, he was kind of devastated. But then he got a call from Houston. The cheating, cheating, can't even say it, but I know it was part of our history. We have to own it. The cheating scandal had just come out. We were forced to fire the manager and the uh, general manager of the organization. It was tough. And that's when the, our, <laughs> our fan base shrunk somewhat. And the players were struggling. But somebody thought to call Dusty Baker. That, here's the thing about Dusty. He is a player's manager. He's not into the analytics and the stats. He plays by his gut, and he goes, he builds relationships with these guys. And he came in, and he began to heal our team. There's just no, from a minister's, there's just no other way to say it. He healed our team. And they, they walked through that diversity, not diversity, they have diversity, adversity. They walked through that adversity. They learned how to do that. They healed, and they grew, which is what we talk about in our becoming statement. So that was 2020, it was his first season here, weird season. And then in 2021, oh, I do want to say, though, in 2020, they, the, the Astros did not win the division under his leadership, but they did win the wild card, and they did go to the um, ALCS. They didn't win. But then in 2021, he finally got his chance. He took our team back to the World Series and lost to the Braves in six games. And I know we have Braves fans here. You don't cheer right now. I'm in a moment. 
This season, Dusty Baker won his 2,000th game as a big league manager. 2,000th game, it's a big, big thing. I think there are only two or three other, other managers who've done it in the history of Major League Baseball. He really had nothing to prove, but there was one more goal he had not yet achieved, taking his team all the way to the championship. And last night, he did it. A date with destiny. Isn't that great? All right, that's all the baseball you're going to get. <laughs> but really, it does demonstrate this idea that don't give up. Keep, keep doing what you are called to do and just keep attending to what... Do I have hat hair? I'm a little self-conscious about it. <laughs> just keep doing what's in front of you and ask for the help you need. And All of us need to heal and grow. And we get to do it together to do it with the support of, um, and I'm, I'm working to not always, my mind is just so binary trained to say brothers and sisters, I was so aware of it when it was in the affirmation today, but with, with the, our, our siblings in, in God, you know, we are all one with this infinite presence and we do it together, we do it together. And it takes us to our final statement, but before, oh, I have one more thing I wanna say about that. Um, we're going through a tough time at Unity of Houston. We just are. Um, we are built for a different era. We have had, um, you know, at, during the 80s, we had thousands of people coming, and we just assumed that this kind of growth would last forever, and culture has really changed. People don't really go to church, and that we've been seeing the effects of that for a while. And then COVID, oh my gosh. And so, um, We've been trying to kind of get back to business as usual, trying to find some way to make the old paradigm work again. And we're really, and believe me, if, if thousands of people show up here, we will not be disappointed. And you can help us do that. But it's been clear that Spirit is asking for some new something from us. And this big air conditioner build that we had this summer, this horrible infrastructure collapse, um, was a big wake-up call for your leadership. And thank you, we have, uh, we've asked people to, get, to give a little extra, and we've raised almost 25% of that $300,000 through your contributions. In, in addition to your pledging, in addition to your regular support, people have been, that's what we do here, and it's wonderful. So $80,000 has come in to help us replenish our reserves. But your board and your ministers, are this, who I consider our leadership team, we have been, and our staff too, but we have really been in this place of, okay, what, how can we serve? How can we be with what is and heal and grow and continue to evolve? So I'm going to ask two things from you, and you too online, two things. The first thing I'm going to ask for is for your prayer. This Friday and Saturday, your leadership team, the ministers and board, will be on retreat. And we're going to be looking at how do we address just the next five years? How do we come from our prosperity consciousness, our willingness to, to see what God's vision is here, but make smart decisions that are based in reality. And it's, it's, it's kind of tough. But we've got a great team. We have an amazing team right now. The best board. I love all my boards. This board, you're the ones. Thank you for being here now. The staff, just incredible team we have right now. So I ask for your prayers, particularly on Friday morning, anytime Friday morning, all the way through the evening, if you think about us, say a prayer for the right and perfect direction that we are wise and, and intuitively guided into the next perfect steps for the health and the prosperity and the vitality of your beloved unity on Saturday morning too. And then the next thing I'm going to ask for you is your ideas, not your complaints. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do the bravest thing I've ever done from this pulpit. Uh, I guess that's is this the, the stage, the pulpit. I'm going to give you my email address. Uh -oh. <laughs> I know, I'm doing it. First initial, last name, mgott at unityhouston.org. And in the subject line, I just want you to write ideas. So I'll know when it comes in, they put it in a special folder, not that special folder. I will read every one, I promise, and I'll respond. And here's the thing, I don't want your complaints. I don't want you to tell me about the things that we used to do that we don't need more and how it's, that's the problem, maybe. But come from what you want what you want to see. And what I'm really asking you to do is get in touch with your higher mind. And I want to see what emerges from us. 
It's for the right next beautiful big steps for us in this journey of our becoming. Okay. And the last of our values is this, our belonging. We create a spiritual home for all people, knowing that we are one body and that we belong to each other. When we were creating this one, our drafting team, uh, it was uh, Cindy and Terry and Amy and seeing the choir over there, we were the drafting team. We had, we had hundreds of people do, just generate tens of thousands of words and statements, and then from those we, we sifted through for the ideas and we came to these, our purpose statement and these three value statements, and it was just magic when it all landed. But this one line kind of stuck with some people, like, is that right, we belong to each other? Because we're all about independence, right? We get, we, we're all about the individual expression of, of, of God, and we're here, I'm here to do my thing, right? I'm not responsible for you. And so we sat with it. And we really came to the understanding that we do belong to each other, that we are sharing this common experience as human beings on the planet at this time. And my decisions and actions impact you, and yours impact mine. And then later, I knew I'd love that phrase. It was Mother Teresa. That was her phrase. She said, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we, be we belong to each other. So that is what we're invited into as a spiritual community. If you're new here, I love what Stacy said. She was talking about the member classes and then doing she, all the video testimonies we had that the more people give here, the more they get. The more people are committed and connected here, they get the full benefit of this spiritual community and the belonging that we offer. We are living in the most isolated and lonely time in modern history, maybe in human history. We just are. People are so isolated. And what we're offering, both for those who are distant and for those who are here in the city, is a place where you can connect with like-minded, spiritually focused individuals who will offer you their support and they will receive yours. Community is incredible. We're not meant to be alone. Jonathan Haidt, the author, he says, we are 90% chimpanzee and 10% honeybee. The secret to our success as a species is our ability to work together and create things together. We're living in a time of tribal division. People are working together, but against other people. Have you noticed? But what we offer is a philosophy and an understanding that there are no other people. There's just us. And actually what we say is there's just one. One life expressing as infinite expressions, but we are all sharing in that life of God. I think I'm done. I'm not going to put the hat on again. No more baseball. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. We're at a crossroads in this community, and I'm excited about it. I am brimming with optimism and faith that the, the, the days that lie ahead of us at Unity of Houston are brilliant and beautiful. And I'm up for it. Our team is up for it. We're up for whatever spirit delivers through us to find the way and to celebrate. Thank you for being a part of our community today. We love you. God bless you. Let's pray. I just invite your consciousness to join me as for the bright and beautiful future of Unity of Houston as we celebrate the glorious and vital present and we honor the depth and the wisdom of our past. We are in a beautiful place together. So what I know in this moment is that the one life of God, present, powerful, loving, intelligent, is right here where we are expressing, generating ideas and creative solutions to all that we face through us, through the people here. So what I know is now that each of us is being uh, in, impelled and, and intuitively guided as to what is our part to play in the brilliant, beautiful new chapter of Unity of Houston. What is ours to do? What is ours to give? What are those divine ideas that are flying around that each of us is willing to catch and to bring into the mix? 
how good it is to stand in faith knowing that we are on the precipice of a beautiful new experience. Something wonderful is happening right here and right now. I can feel it. It's moving in me at the energetic level. And I simply trust that it is guiding us into the right actions, forms, and ideas that will reveal it in the world of form and time and space. But I know that it's done. And with this knowing, with this gratitude, I release this prayer, knowing that the law of cause and effect is already responding to the thoughts spoken and known in this moment. And the perfect demonstration is already on its way. We give thanks. We let it be. And so it is. Amen. Wherever you are on your path, you are welcome here. If no one has told you today that they love you and that you are worthy of belonging and connection, I love you and you are worthy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.